Jen Brotherhood has just witnessed her son murder, and he provides no explanation why. Jen goes to sleep that night, struggling to understand what would motivate her son to kill. When she awakes, she finds herself in the previous day. Is this the right place and time for the book? Wrong place, wrong time. (laughs) The author, Jillian McAllister. And you're listening to Lit Society. Let's get lit. Let's get lit. readers this is alexis and this is kari and you're listening to lit society a podcast about books and drama indeed this week readers we're gonna scratch the theme of the week and jump into society says yay guys guys caramel Cheers and all the cheers, 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 because we love to hear from our readers. We like compliments. It boosts us a little bit. Okay. (laughs) So listen, this is where we share your comments with the rest of our lit society. Kari, is there a comment that is particularly lit that you want to share with us today? Yes, this comes from Apple Podcasts, and this is from a user with a very long name and some numbers, letters, but they say love. One of the best book podcasts out there. Funny, insightful, original. It's got it all. Thank you so much. And this was just left for us last week. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, yeah, yeah, yes. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. That's the username. <laughs> We love you too. Thank you for they supporting our show. What about yeah. you, Alexis? Is there a comment that a listener has left um, on Apple, Spotify now, uh, social media that you thought was particularly lit? Yeah, yeah. Um, this message is from Tracy is reading. I like the name, Tracy, <laughs> on Instagram. And they said, I just discovered your hysterical, all caps, and informative podcast last week, and I love it. Currently (laughs) listening to y'all do Animal Farm. Love, love, love your energy about books and reading. You guys cover Animal Farm (laughs) in our first season. And Tracy, (laughs) thank you so much for the compliment and the comment. I think Tracy was reading us a little bit. She said we hysterical. <laughs> well, you know, self-aware, it's important to be. Mm-hmm. Thank I you. Say that is important. It's important. Take it how you want to take it. I'm going to take it as a compliment, okay? <laughs> I love being called hysterical. <laughs> Remember, readers, to have your comments shared. Message us on Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, or We love it when you leave us a review on Apple Podcasts and Spotify. Indeed. Well, I think we should still take a quick break before we jump into our author and context. You want to do that? Okay, sounds good. All right. back. Kari, what can you share with us about the author and maybe some context with the book? Yeah, so Jillian McAllister is born in 1985. Uh, she was a best-selling author for the New York Times or on the New York Times bestselling list and the British Sunday Times. That's right, she's English. Um, <laughs> so that explains a lot of the locations, the emergency numbers, and a lot of the language used in this book. Um, her works have been translated into 40 languages. She's been selected for Reese Witherspoon's book, where a lot of our reads actually come from just because so many writers that are women are on Reese Witherspoon's list and often make their way to our show. Um, And she was shortlisted for a National Book Award. Several of her novels have been optioned for television and film. And before we get too far into it, do you think this book would make a good TV show or like a miniseries or movie? I would say a miniseries. Yeah, I could see that. Yeah, Mm -hmm. definitely a miniseries. Not, yeah. Not a movie, not a big screen thing, but I could see it 
uh, drawn out over four or five episodes every day waking up in it or every episode waking up in a new day, like 24, but we'll get to that. Right, right. Um, so here's her bibliography real, real quick. 2017, Everything But The Truth. 2017, Anything You Do Say. I like that title. 2018, No Further Questions. 2019, The Evidence Against You. 2020, How to Disappear. 2021, That Night. And 2021, Wrong Place, Wrong Time. We are reading her latest novel, today. And that is Jillian McAllister. Oh, wow. Thank you for sharing, Kari. And now, please share with us a brief synopsis before we our deep dive. One night, waiting for her son to come home before curfew, Jen witnesses her Todd, her quiet, sciency little boy mm-hmm. of 18 years old, commit a murder. But why? But how? He offers no explanation, and the next day she wakes up in the past. Alexis, who do you think would enjoy reading Wrong Place, Wrong Time by Jillian McAllister? So immediately comes to mind, and I think we just love this genre, apparently, <laughs> um, a Lisa Jewell book. Or, yeah, she has um, a blurb on the cover, actually. Oh, okay. All right. Mm-hmm. So one of her books, or um, even... When I think about them being in the house and the cover of the book, um, AJ Finn. <laughs> oh, like, um, what is it? Woman in the window? Yeah. Woman in the oh, window. Cause she was literally in the window when, out? when she was uh, motivated to act. So okay, yeah, that's I what like it makes that. me think of. And then, <laughs> um, how about you? Why did you choose this book? I chose this book because I was looking for a fun, cozy murder mystery Uh, and I went to Goodreads. Why? I don't know, you guys. I don't know. It's like, I'm in a love-hate-hate relationship with Goodreads. (laughs) If I'm at a loss, sometimes I'll peruse their lists and just pick one based on the reviews and context clues about the story. And that's what I did in this case. Nothing more, nothing less. Um, (laughs) So yeah, that's that. (laughs) <laughs> well, Kari, are you ready to take a spoiler-filled deep dive into Wrong Place, Wrong Time? Yes, and I am still contemplating if I'm going to spoil this book. It just came out last year. Alexis, I'll let you make the choice. Okay. Oh, should I just keep going and you tell me when to stop? Uh, yeah, because I mean, this is like, it's a lot. There are a few shoes dropped. So we we won't drop all the shoes. How about that? We yeah. just going to drop a couple shoes. Do that. Do that. Okay. Only a few. Don't drop them all. Part one, curfew. Day zero. It's Saturday, the 29th of October. So like we said, Jen's waiting for her 18-year-old son to come home. His name's Todd. It's past midnight. And the clock falls back tonight. Like the, the hours change, which I wasn't actually sure they did that in England. Yeah, they do. Okay. Her her aging but beautiful and loving husband comes downstairs naked. He's jokey. He's not worried. He's like, isn't our son's curfew 1 a.m. anyway? And she looks at him. (laughs) She looks at him and thinks, you know, it's always been this way. He's so carefree. He doesn't he doesn't believe in corporate jobs because he doesn't want to be a part of the establishment. And no matter how many years passes, he still, you know, has his ways that really excite her. She she just loves him. So she carved a pumpkin that day um, and she's talking to him about it. He turns his back to the window and she goes, everyone can see your butt. And then he <laughs> says, well, they'll just think it's another pumpkin. And she says, oh, that's my that's my Kelly. That's his name. Okay, so she continues looking outside and sees her son approaching to her relief, but it looks like he sees something. An older figure catches her son's eye. Jen follows her son's gaze and sees someone is hurrying toward him. She rushes to the door before experiencing a dizzying episode of deja vu. Her and Kelly both run out the door and toward their son. Kelly yells, stop, but that's when it happens, a knife and a body lying on the ground in blood. Mm. Jane blinks in shock and then looks up at her son, 
who has dropped the knife. This is a great twist for the reader because you just assume that the older figure has murdered her son. Um, however, it is her son who is doing the slicing and dicing. Jen stares at her son's face. She never could read him and she's a lawyer. She doesn't know if he's regretful. I had to. There was no choice, Todd says. Mm. The police take him away. Her husband's, the look on his face, she summarizes as heartbroken. That is the look of a heartbroken man. After an unproductive visit to the police station, Kelly and Jane return home. Uh, they're led into their own house by the forensics team who are searching through everything. And finally, Jen sits down and cries. She goes to bed sleeps restlessly and wakes to her son in his room, completely unaware of what the family has experienced the night huh? before. Mm -hmm. Jen looks outside. All the pumpkins from her neighbor's porches are gone. What is going on? He wasn't out last night, Todd. She calls her husband. He has no idea what she's talking about. The clocks don't even go back tonight. They go back tomorrow night. She's woken in the previous day. What? <laughs> oh. Her son isn't a murderer, yet Jen vomits. That's an appropriate response. It's a lot. <laughs> Alexis, is there a day you would like to relive in your life? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Care to share? No. Uh huh. The Just last relive fight you had, for the fun out of that it. Aggression. Go ahead. <laughs> relive for the fun of it, or relive for the oh. uh, for the whatever. For whatever, huh? Well, yeah. I I think I could relive quite a few days and make different decisions. Um, or like she did, just look back and figure out what did I miss here. Yeah, I can think about a couple of days. How about you? Yeah, why not course correct? Um, also, if there's anyone in our lives, which we all have experienced that are no longer with us, perhaps we take another day with them. Maybe we wouldn't change anything. We would just linger in another day with that person. Um, personally, I think I would go back and um, make all the mistakes again. So <laughs> her husband, which, what I'm going to do, I'm just going to do the same. That's I'm still so me. Helpful, I don't know. Whatever. <laughs> her husband senses her stress and says he'll come home early. He's at work already. And she's glad that he is him, that he's this, a family man. He doesn't go out to bars after work. He's a painter, by the way. And not like Leonardo. He like paints walls um, like a decorator, basically. So mm -hmm. that's cool. So he goes home. Um, he doesn't like hang out with other people. His family is like his life, basically. Uh, when he stepped out of the room, Jen goes through her son's bags and finds what she's expecting but didn't want to see, a knife. She Ooh. takes it. Maybe she can stop what happened from happening. So let's get a little backstory on Jen and Kelly. They met 20 years ago. He'd walked into her father's law firm asking if they wanted any decorating done. Her father turned him down, but she went to lunch with him more by accident than anything else. They had so much to say to each other, and he's still the best listener she knows. He hates the noise of cities, um, and both of his parents are dead, by the way. So her husband's an orphan of sorts. He only sees his old school friends once a year during their ceremonious camping trip. So he's a man of dark humor, cynicism, and she loves him. Back to Jen. Jen goes to sleep and wakes to the day before the day before. <laughs> I was so confused and made a sneeze jump up out of me. It was very much so. <laughs> You guys, she's traveling backwards. She is realizing that when she sleeps, instead of time moving forward, it is moving back a day, one day for every time uh, she sleeps at night. She decides to confide <laughs> in her friend and colleague. What? She sleeps at night. Because like if she falls asleep in the afternoon, don't think it's good. She don't take naps. That's <laughs> actually there's a um, there's some critical questions in the story that are answered that I've assumed. This woman does not nap. She doesn't know a nap. She's never seen a nap in her life. I mean, but how many people do nap? 
You can't doze off? No. <laughs> I remember a time in my life where that was never a thing. I'm just working and bedtime yeah, that's is bedtime. True. Yeah, and she but she's a lawyer. She's I actually didn't understand what type of law she practices, but if she's reading briefs or she's family researching law. a lot. She's a divorce lawyer. She's oh, that's law. right. Yeah, yeah. Mm, yeah. Yeah, you're right. Yeah, so she don't nap. That's fine. <laughs> so when she sleeps at night, then the thing happens where she goes back in time each day or she doesn't go back in time i don't want to phrase it that way she just wakes up to the previous day okay you guys let's move right on. don't think about like, it too much Ooh, i'm back in time it's like i woke up and it's a different day it's the day before the day before the day before mm, well yes she's not like oh dinosaurs yeah good point <laughs> yeah yeah okay so <laughs> she just <laughs> It's back days within her life. I feel like I'm focusing too much on this. It's breaking my brain. <laughs> she decides to confide in her friend, Rakish. And Rakish is also a colleague. He's a lawyer now, but he used to be a doctor. Uh, he hates both professions, but he's very good at it. He's a brilliant man. So he tries to calm her. She has no way to prove what she's going through to him. And so he dismisses it as forgetfulness. She knows mm -hmm. it's not. Oddly, Ray Kish has a friend that did a study on if it's possible to get stuck in a time loop for his PhD. And Ray, Ray Kish uh, proofread that uh, doc for him. The friend's name, by the way, is Andy, Andy Vatiz. So, or Vatizi. So that's something to keep in mind, Andy. So Jen decides she she's has to stop the tragedy. That's what it is. She has to stop her son from doing, from doing the thing. So maybe that's the way to stop the time loop. You stop the tragedy from happening. Do change something in the past to stop the murder from happening. And then you can start going in the forward again. So she follows her son, who is a terrible driver. Thankfully, he doesn't check his rear view mirror once. Um, so it's very easy. <laughs> she watches as he parks and walks into a building. She Googles the address of the building. It's registered as the Office of Cutting and Sewing Limited, owned by Ezra Michaels and Joseph Jones. As Todd enters the house... Um, Another man leaves. The man walking out, she's seen before and she quickly realizes she's staring at a dead man or mm. a man who has died before. Mm. So this is the man that her son killed. Died she before. walks up to him and starts with honesty. Hi, hi. Todd is my son and I'm just trying to be sure he's not in with the wrong crowd. Um, the man who we find uh, is Joseph. Looks at her oddly and is like, no, Todd's a good kid. He's dating Ezra's niece. The man responds and the man walks away. He's eager to end this conversation. Jen makes her way inside of the building to use the restroom to her son's horror. He's like, what are you doing here, mom? I oh, know, you crazy, know, I'm right? 40. I have to use the restroom. She finds a cell phone and reads the messages. She finds that the girl her son is dating seems to be in love with him. Fast forward a little bit. One evening, Jen convinces her husband, Kelly, um, of what she's going through. And she does this by remembering on the news, a car accident where a drunk driver hit something and walked out of the car completely fine. No one was injured. She takes Kelly to that intersection. They watch it happen just as she said. She says, now, look, a neighbor's going to come out and call for help. And a neighbor steps out and says, I'll dial 999. And I'm like, girl, dial 991. That's an emergency. I mean, 911. <laughs> See, I don't even know. That really had you, huh? Mm. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> so so um, he's like, they have to take a long walk. He has to process it. He asks her, if it was me, would you believe me? And she goes, no. And they laugh. And and um, this is a, a way... Uh, to really help her not be alone, at least on this day, because when they go to sleep and she's wrapped in his arms, she knows that he understands and believes what she's going through. Because mm. this is a very lonely way to live, you know, going back a day instead of waking up forward. <laughs> I don't know what I'm saying. I'm so tired. Um, but it don't matter because she go go to sleep, wake up and he going to be like, huh, said what now? Accident who? So that was just a few hours of not lonely with her husband. Um, she convinced she, she convinces Rakish to schedule a meeting for her with his old friend Andy. He's like, how you know Andy? Yeah. Anyway, 
She's like, yeah, yeah, Andy, the quantum theorist. For the first time, Jen is speaking with someone who doesn't simply dismiss her. And in front of Andy, um, she starts to explain that he'll win an award in two days. And he's like, how do you know that information? It's embargoed. He's like slightly American or something. And so she's like, trust me, I know. He's like, OK, I'm listening. Together, they theorize that the weight of what she saw when her son killed that man threw her in a time loop is real scientific, you guys. Perhaps she's able to stop the crime before it happens and then can be can begin traveling forward again. So mm-hmm. listen, this is where mm-hmm. I deduce that her deja vu um, happened because of that excitable event. And that is why she is looping. So just in line with what he's saying, it's the deja vu that she experienced when she was watching what was about to happen, happen. Thank you for that. To me, it is obvious that is what Jillian wants us to believe. However, Jillian, I got a question. If she's thrown into this time loop by the weight of watching her son murder someone, then the deja vu should have occurred after the event. Why would she experience the deja vu before the event? It's the upcomingness of what's about to happen. That So the event surrounding what happened, not the event itself, is what pushed her into the deja vu. I got it. Cause quantum theory is kind of like it all happened before anyway. And so you're just in the wrong place in the occurrence of it happening. Okay. Got it. Thank you. Right. I'm glad we got a science, a quantum theorist here. <laughs> Cause this is the non to the sense. Well, let me just okay. say, I learned this <laughs> from when we read about uh, Lisa Genove's book yes. and we talked about deja vu in mm-hmm. the memories book. Okay, thank you. Mm-hmm. Okay. That's science degree. <laughs> All right. So another morning and weeks before the event, Todd is going running with Kelly. He wakes up and he's like, dad's making me go running. And he looks so happy. And she's like, that's my boy. And this is my family. And I wish it would just stay this way. He's her happy boy again. Albeit he's 18 years old. Uh, She goes through (laughs) his room and finds a few things that give her pause. Number one is a badge belonging to police officer Ryan, along with some information about a missing baby. And then something about Nicola like a note or something like that. I can't remember. So what's her son wrapped up in? She wonders. That's the phone that talks about Nicola. It's the phone, the burner phone that was in the bag. There's a burner phone. Yeah. And it's in the bag and it has messages. Where she reads text messages Mm -hmm. and she's like, oh, this is great. But thank you. Because the text messages have dates and she can actually put things together in the past. That way, when she wakes up on any of these dates in the past, she can likely know what to look for or signs in her family that something is amiss. Part two, identity. So let's talk about Ryan, who he is and why he's joined the police force. Uh, Ryan is a guy with hopes and dreams of making a difference in the world. And so for some reason, he becomes an officer of the law. Pretty soon (laughs) he um, is recruited for a top secret mission. Actually, his faith, his fifth, his faith, his fifth day of work, Leo asked Ryan to join him in a back room. And there Leo and Jamie sit at a table. Ryan sits opposite them and they tell him they need info on an organized crime gang operating. How would Ryan like to do a bit of research? So he's been recruited. Mm. Within the police for a secret job. Okay. So Ryan's like, yeah, yeah, I want to make a difference. Great. Okay. Moving on or actually moving back. Ooh, you got Sorry. us. <laughs> you got us, Kari. <laughs> Jen confides in one of her clients inappropriately. The client's name is Gina. And in the future, she knows that her and Gina become friends. Gina's getting a divorce and wants to keep her kids from her husband so that he'll miss the kids and come back to her. Okay. <laughs> it's complicated. Is it? Okay. All right. Jen asked Gina, because Gina's actually a private investigator. One of the things Gina says in the future is, how did I not see the signs of my husband's infidelity? It's what I do for a living. Like, how did I not see it? 
So um, remembering that, Jen is like, well, maybe Gina can help me put this together. So without telling her all the crazy stuff, like I, every day I wake up, it's a day in the past because ain't nobody going to listen to nothing you have to nobody. say after that. Nobody. Um, instead, <laughs> Jen asked Gina about the poster, um, about the missing child, the badge that says Ryan and the text messages. Todd's been behaving strangely. And then um, Jen found these items. Gina will find out what she can, she promises. That night, Jen decides to follow Ezra and she watches him meet a boy Todd's age, um, changing plates on cars. Um, So what happens is that Jen deduces by what she sees is that this person named Ezra um, meets kids Todd's age. They change plates on cars and then put those cars on boats and ship them off Uh to Chicago. No, I don't, I don't know, to somewhere and then sell them, you know? Mm -hmm. So um, she deduces that they're stealing people's cars out of their driveways late at night, you know? Gina texts her. She hasn't found much except that the officer, Ryan, whose badge that was, he's dead. (gasps) (gasps) Jen calls Andy, a man she's never met this day. Mm-hmm. Is that like heart stopping? Is that yeah? Is that what you were experiencing? Just, okay, yeah. <gasps> Gasp! Oh, oh okay. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Jen calls Andy. Like I said, the this is a man now that she's never met this day. He's the quantum theorist or the something like that. She lets him know he'll win an award. She tells Again. him about what he wears when they meet in a coffee shop for the first time in the future. He's willing to suspend belief and help her think through her situation. She's now going back, not days, but weeks. Clearly, she needs to find someone. Nicola Williams, perhaps? Find Nicola? Is that what she needs to do? That's what they decide she has to do. Crosby Sports Bar. Jen follows Todd there that night. She's so tired. She wants to sleep, but she doesn't. She watches her son secretly. He's acting full bravado mode. Todd is then being introduced to Nicola, but his texts showed he's already met her. So that burner phone in his room, there were texts to Nicola, but now he's in this bar meeting Nicola, acting all surprised. And she's like surprised because he's a good actor. He's like, oh, okay, nice to meet you, Nicola. Like, that's weird. Like, mm-mm, mm-mm. You've been texting her. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And because she's his mother, Jen can tell even from afar that Todd is uncomfortable. He then leaves the group and makes a call with an earshot of his mom. So convenient. Um, And he says things like, I'm trying to phase Cleo out. We're at the end of the line, aren't we? I'll ask Nicola. See you at home. Mm. What? That last line echoes in Jen's ears. See you at home. (sighs) person on the other end of the line is Kelly, her husband. Uh-oh. The, se- <laughs> the reason why Todd was acting so well as if he'd never met Nicola is because he hasn't. The secret phone, the badge, everything. It was Kelly's, not Todd's. Todd wasn't acting when he met Nicola. He is the innocent party here. Kelly knows everything. Mm-hmm. Back to Ryan. He's talking to Leo. Remember, that's one of the officers recruiting him about his undercover persona. Jamie walks in. One of the stolen cars had a baby in it. Okay. They don't like it. So they done stole a car, mm-hmm. hoping to sell it. And they didn't know it was a baby inside. And they the police like find out. Mm-mm. And that car is headed to the port. And Ryan thinks about that baby being all alone, wailing in the back of a car, headed to a boat. Scary. Back to Jen. Later, Jen overhears a convo between Kelly and Todd. Why are you telling me this? You have to break up with Cleo. That'll arouse more confusion, not to mention break my heart. I'm sorry it has to be this way, son. I can't believe you involved me in this, dad. Lies, kidnapped kids. Oh, I hate you, dad. So I'm paraphrasing. (laughs) Yeah, a lot. Okay. (laughs) Jen listens as Todd storms away and Kelly begins to cry. 
What are her husband and son involved in? She storms into the house and confronts her husband about the call. He does not, he denies everything. He then suggests they order takeaway since there's little to eat and he'll pick it up. She remembers living this day the first time and how enjoyable it was. Like there was nothing in the house. So I think they ordered Thai food and ate it. And it was just a little cute family moment. But now she sees it for what it really was. He's trying to leave the house for some reason. Um, mm, mm, mm. And there's something else. There's like a little beep or notification. And she's because she's paying attention more. Um, his phone is in his front pack pocket, but he grabs his ba- back pocket or something like that. So she knows he has a burner phone. Mm-mm-mm. He pretends to leave for takeout, although he does eventually get takeout. I mean, several houses <laughs> he has down. To stick to the story. <laughs> it's got to get the takeout. <laughs> Can I just say, I'm sorry, <laughs> pause. Why is everybody doing their dirt so close to the house and within earshot of the mom? The mom will be in a car and see and hear everything happening inside a sports bar. She'll, go ahead. No, listen, listen. She didn't pay attention to these things before, remember? Uh-huh. She was uh-huh. always involved in her work. So they could do these things and they knew she just... Too absorbed in work. She wouldn't have paid. She's back in this day and she's paying attention. That's an excellent point, Alexis. How much do we miss in our life because we aren't paying attention? Mm -hmm. Mm, Very good. Okay. Well, dad walks like two feet from the house. (laughs) Meets (laughs) up. (laughs) He meets up with someone. Um, Yeah. And it's Joseph. Jen watches in dark silence from the comfort of their home as her husband meets with this man. He could have um, done this. uh, How could he do this under her nose? Mm -hmm. She wonders. Joseph says something and hands Kelly a package. Jen asks Todd if he knows the man his father's talking to and Todd at first denies it. And then he says, yeah, I mean, that's Chloe's uncle's friend. But I can't tell you because dad told me not to tell you for whatever reason. He said um, him and and that guy went way back and you wouldn't like him. So not to tell you. Mm -hmm. And Jen is like, your dad is having you keep secrets from me. (laughs) Jen works out on her own that whatever happened, Kelly thought he could handle it. And when it became clear he couldn't, he asked his son to end his relationship with Chloe. We haven't talked much about Chloe, but Chloe is this girl. She's beautiful, glamorous, and very much um, in love with Todd. Todd is like a kind of quiet, nerdy kid, but like very handsome. Mm -hmm. And they feel like they're in love for the first time in their lives. So this could really be like true love and they'll be in love forever. He's 18. Mm-hmm. But yes, this happens. So um, for his dad to tell him to break it off with Chloe breaks Todd's heart and he doesn't understand why. Jen rounds the street and sees her husband is on his secret phone. She listens from a distance. <laughs> I've done it now. And now it's time for your end. Thank you, Nick. I have to go. Have to make an appearance at home. That last line that uh, Kelly says breaks Jen's heart. Yeah. Make an appearance at home. Yeah, that totally sounds like he's just doing it um, Mm -hmm. for a whole ruse. Yeah. That cut me Mm -hmm. to my heart, too. Did it? Yeah. Like, is he even married to me? (sighs) Is that a cover? Yeah. Like, what is going on? What is going on? So Jen confronts Kelly and he tells her not to look into what she's found. Don't look into the baby and definitely don't look into Joseph. You're in danger, girl. Mm. That's what he says to his wife. Girl, you in danger. Settle <laughs> she down. She feels cold. Sit down alone. somewhere. Mm-hmm. Back to Ryan. <laughs> In the meeting at the police station, Ryan learns that a new mother put her baby in the car, intending to drive late at night with the child to help the child sleep. But she put the baby in the car, stepped back into the house for something. I mean, it's late at night. Mm -hmm. She was only going to be gone for a second. And when she came out, her car was stolen. The baby was alone with criminals headed for the pier. Devastation to the nation. Now back to Jen, still waking farther and farther in the past. Jen goes into her office at work and asks what is now a new trainee to spy on a secret meeting. This trainee fortunately doesn't know what her husband looks like, doesn't know what Kelly looks like. And it's her first day on the job. Now, truthfully, of course, 
Jen knows this trainee well, knows she's a brilliant girl, um, but she's got to sacrifice what will be in the future for what is needed right now. So the girl's all too eager to be sent on this mission and she spies on Nick and Kelly. Okay. She comes back with information. This Nicola and Kelly, Nicola is a woman, so I'm going to call her Nick, but it's a woman just so you know. Nick wants Kelly to do something. He doesn't want to. They're obviously not having an affair. It's like uh, Nick is asking him to complete something he's supposed to have done. Uh, She says he owes them. Mm. They might be working with a man named Joseph too. Joseph is inside, whatever that means. And Jen is like, he's in prison, you idiot. (laughs) Her trainee in her mind. I'm like mad at her. Because why do I know what that means? Shoot. Was that part of the job description? (laughs) So Jen searches for Joseph Jones prison and she finds him right away. And the crimes he's committed. Ooh, they make a long list. Mm. This man is a crim in all. Also during the meeting, Kelly says he loves his wife. I don't want to do this. I just want to go home to my family. Mm. I love my wife. Again, I'm paraphrasing. And the mention of loving his wife brings Jen to tears. Mm. 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 She wakes in the past again. And that day, no one other than Joseph is in her office. What? Joseph's supposed to be in the prison. Nope. He's in her office waiting for her, looking for her husband. I've been away, he says. Wanted to restart something. And he walks out. Ooh. (laughs) Another day. (laughs) She follows Kelly on one of these supposed annual camping trips. And the trail leads to an abandoned house. Inside is a photo of her husband standing with a man that looks like him. It was taken when Kelly was about 20. The man has her eyes, her husband's eyes, excuse me, and Todd's eyes. Mm -hmm. Those same dark blue navy eyes. That man is a relative. Who really is my husband? Mm, For sure, for sure. Another day, she talks uh, things through with Andy. He gives her a hack for the next time they call. I had an imaginary friend in school named Bob. I'm paraphrasing, but that's basically it. (laughs) If you walk up to me in the future, in the past, because we in the future, if you walk up to me in the past and I've never met you, say, I know your imaginary friend was Bob and I'll believe whatever you say. Because I Because he gets a lot of... Yeah, go ahead. (laughs) Yeah, he get a lot of people reaching out to him like, I traveled in the past. And he's like, "Okay, well, my imaginary friend was Bob. If you come back and tell me that, I'll believe you. And no one's ever come back. (laughs) Okay, so Jen realizes why she's waking this particular day. It's the day her father dies. Mm. She has so many regrets. His death was sudden. No one expected it. It was like after she left his house one day, I think he died that night. Actually, I don't even know if she was over there that day. But anyway, she tries to focus on the murder, but she must first make this right. Kelly and her dad were always cordial, but never close. And she tells Kelly that she's going to see dad. I'm going to take a moment to see dad. And Kelly's like, great, have fun. Mm -hmm. They talk and linger. She confides that Kelly is hiding something from her and her dad says something so peculiar, peculiar. He says, Kelly's a straight guy. He's a good guy and he takes good care of you. That's a good man. Mm-hmm. What? I didn't even know you liked him like that. Hmm. Mm. As they're sitting, she sees the signs in time and calls 999 saving her dad's life. Not that it matters because she's going to go to sleep and wake up yesterday. No, no, go ahead, go ahead. (laughs) But she doesn't wake up yesterday. She wakes up two years in the past. What? She jumped two whole years back. Todd is 16. Ryan, the officer, though, is already dead. What does this mean? So she does some searching for Ryan, finds out he's still dead. She's trying to figure out who this officer was. Did her husband kill Ryan? Mm -hmm. Like, what's going on? Then Todd is 13. Then he's three. Whoa. Time (laughs) is moving back rather quickly now. She's in their small first family home and she's asking Kelly the question she never asked about his childhood. He says, our dad, I haven't seen him since I was three. Our dad, she says, I thought you were an only child. I I am, he says. I I said, my dad. No, you didn't. (laughs) And your mother died. (laughs) 
<laughs> your mother died when? Very young. I was very young. Very young. She later finds Kelly crying in the bathroom. She holds him. I just miss my mom, he says. I know, she responds. And she does know. A tall man stands in the middle of the room. We're back with Ryan now. A tall man stands in the middle of the room giving Ryan and his partner Angela a job. Ryan is undercover. So is Angela. But the man, of course, is unaware. The man's name is what, Alexis? Joseph. The woman's name is what, Alexis? Nicola. And Ryan identifies himself as who, Alexis? Kelly. Da, 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 da. You guys, Kelly is the name he chose because it was his brother's name and he'd always want to answer to it if someone yelled it at a bar. That's what they say. Choose a name that means something to you. So if ever someone walks into a bar and goes, hey, Kelly, you can't be like, <laughs> Oh, oh, hey. <laughs> now you got to answer to that name right away if it's your fake name. So he said, that's the name I'm going to pick. Right. He thinks about Kelly in the night he got in too deep and hung himself. He done it in the loft, not wanting to be found. He loved his brother. So Ryan chose the name Kelly. Mm-hmm. I was like, this is where I'll stop. But I won't. Uh-oh. Uh-oh. I might oh, ruin the my. book. Okay. Ah. If you guys... <laughs> If you guys like what you hear and you want to go read the book for yourself, stop listening to this show. Why do you even listen to our show? We ruin books. Go read the book because I'm going to continue a little bit and I don't know when I'll stop. Okay, here we go. Jen wakes to a time before Todd was born. Kelly, a painter, is going to a last minute conference. What kind of conference a painter got to go to at the last minute? Uh, a painting conference, National Association of Painters. Okay. Okay. What is Sharon Williams really doing? Is that the <laughs> Illuminati? So she follows him. They end up at a courthouse. Again, she's following him secretly. She's really good at that. Uh, they end up at a courthouse. She's like, why is my Kelly walking into a courthouse? It's the day of the trial for Joseph Jones. Mm -hmm. (gasps) That's why I'm here. Joseph is young. He's as young as Todd is in her present. Everyone else's future. There's a secret witness behind the curtain. All the jurors, or no, the jurors can stay, but everyone else is asked to leave the courtroom. The lawyer stays, Jen stays. Um, well, she's, she's not, not even a, on this case. No, she leaves how. too. And she, she leaves. Oh, she does yeah, leave, she but leaves. she hears this. No, she, she, so. Oh, yes. I'm so sorry, you guys. Everyone, including the jury, is asked to leave the courtroom. Right. Then they set up a curtain. Then a witness comes behind the curtain. Then everyone else is brought back into the courtroom. Right. Uh, so this witness obviously needs privacy. Thank you, Alexis. Um, as soon as he says his first word, Jen knows who that secret witness is. Ah. It's Kelly. It's her Kelly. It's her Kelly. His voice is undeniable. Mm-hmm. Her husband is a police officer. He never told her his life is a lie. He was chosen to infiltrate an organized crime ring. She confronts him outside and he admits everything. So, Alexis, why did Kelly stay Kelly? Well, he stayed Kelly because he had already met her the day before and Mm -hmm. he didn't want to change that. He he met her as Kelly. He put on the persona of Kelly, persona of Kelly. And so he wanted to maintain that. Otherwise, it would put everything at risk, he felt. That's right. He met Jen. He fell in love and he gave up. He gave up everything, including his living mother. Now that that was a little far. He said, I'm not going to talk to my mother again. And that's why he was crying in the future, his future anyway, because he missed his mother who was still living likely. He couldn't reach out to her because he decided to adopt the Kelly persona, uh, as Alexis said. Now, he's not going to be a criminal, but he has to stay under the radar if he wants to keep this name. And then his thinking is, if Joseph Jones ever gets out of prison, he won't be able to find me. It's like, my name is Kelly. I don't know. He's terrible. I don't know. He hasn't thought. Th- he hasn't thought it through. <laughs> he fell in love. <laughs> and he chose love over uh, everything else. And his mom he chose love over logic. <laughs> Not logic. <laughs> sure. Mm-hmm. So uh, 
you guys, did we explain further how they first met? Um, you read the book, readers. I already know this. So you know, as we stated before, that Kelly and Jim met because Kelly walked into her dad's law firm mm-hmm. and was like, hey, y'all need decorating? Well, what we come to find out is Kelly was there in his role as a private investigator. He asked Jen to go make him a tea. And while she stepped away, um, he like rummaged through her desk looking for evidence um, because her dad was involved in something bad. Dang, I, mm-hmm. I remember that differently. OK. All right. How do you remember it? So I remember she came to he came to the office, asked for um a painter job, right? Yeah. And then she was like, well, I don't do just basic painting just because you walked in off the street. And he's <laughs> like, oh, okay, okay. And I need to ask for the owner. Can I meet the owner? And she was like, mm-hmm. okay. And then they skipped scenes. They went to the next scene. Yeah, Alexis is right too. So, <laughs> but what I said happened, I just can't remember <laughs> when or how, but Alexis <laughs> is right. Uh, so anyway, they then they was just together. They it was like love at first sight. Yeah. So after um, he realized he was in love with Jen, he went to the her dad's office and he goes, "Look, I can get you off, but you have to cooperate." This is what her father was involved in. Whoa! Um, after her mother died. Things money got really tight for their family. And so to make extra money, he started helping an organized crime ring figure out when his clients would not be at home so that they could steal his their cars. So he knew that his clients were involved in a timeshare. So whenever they were away on vacation, he would tell the organized crime ring, he would tell Joseph, hey, um, Joe Schmo isn't at home. You can steal the car out of the driveway. He's not there. So that was going on for a while. Like it paid for her whole education. Mm -hmm. Little did she know. Mm -hmm. Um, However, one of the cars they stole had that baby in the backseat and it became a bigger thing. It was wrong to begin with, but now it's like possibly murderous. No one knows what happened to that baby. And so um, (laughs) Kelly storms in and is like, I am going, I love your daughter. So I'll get you off. But you uh, really got to stop doing bad stuff and like kind of stay away from us a little bit, probably. I don't know. So anyway, um, and to his credit, her dad is like, I would go to jail if I thought you weren't a good guy for my daughter. So why do you love her? Why do you why have you decided this? Um, So he stays out of jail. So obviously he's like, fine. And that's why him and Kelly don't hang out a lot. They're just cordial to each other. And that day, Kelly burned Ryan. He like decided I won't be Ryan anymore. I'm going to just remain Kelly because that's how she knows me. Is there any way to get around this, Alexis, in your mind? Like, was this the best option? He could have just <laughs> that, that was his <laughs> middle name. Yes. No, I think there were other options. You always have other options. That's what Yahoo says. <laughs> Follow me here. (laughs) Alexis, what if he went to Jen and said, listen, you know, you've known me for a few weeks, maybe a few months as Kelly. That's not my real name. My real name is Ryan. I am an undercover officer. He ain't even got to tell her about her dad if he wants to keep a lie. But just so you know, this is my name. And now you have the choice. Do you want to stay with me? Knowing that there's some danger there. Or do you want to end it here? I respect whatever choice you make. So wait, are you saying he he should wait a couple months or tell her right I'm away? I'm saying he should wait till Joseph is put away. Oh, yeah, that would have been a couple months. Mm-hmm. I mean, that's one way. Mm-hmm. No, that man decided to live <laughs> his life a lie and never talk to his mama again. <sighs> So I After feel some type of way days. about him it all being a lie. He was undercover. Okay. Okay. So the lie to me, now you're undercover, that's that's your business. But the lie comes when you start telling your wife and then your son, this is me and this is my past. And ain't none of that true. Why though? Why? His past wasn't that off. The only part that was a lie was that he was a painter. 
How about you got a living grandma? I don't know. That's wild. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> no, so know. she said that she thinks that the the grandmother was dead by the time um, Todd was three years old and he was crying in the bathroom. She does say that. And then she later says he was crying because his mother was likely still alive. Oh, I thought she said he But he likely couldn't died. talk to her. Oh. And that's when I was like, kind of like, Kelly, you need to make better life choices. <laughs> I didn't know you had a living mom out here who only got one living son and it's you. That's kind of wild. I don't know. Mm. You left your mama who's a widow without any type of family support. Kelly, come on. And for what, Jen? I mean, okay, no. Nah. Maybe he was, was sending terrible. mama money. With what job? He's, I don't know. Now he was a painter, okay? That is the job. Now you're right. However, I don't think he has enough to support two households. But I could that, be wrong. You're not necessarily supporting. You contributed to your mama. And he would do it if he was in the same you know, if he was making himself available, he wouldn't be supporting her whole household. He would just be throwing her off some. Throwing her <laughs> off some. That's Alexis talk for giving your mom a couple dollars occasionally. Okay. All right. That's fine. Okay. Look, I just think lying is never the best option ever, ever. And this all could have just been a lot easier on everyone if the truth was even considered. Um, But whatever. <laughs> So that's that on that. Now I'm going to ruin the book because I lost patience. <laughs> um, so here we go, y'all. <laughs> Jen decides to go to the police as she wakes up in the past in a time where she's not even met Kelly. She walks in. He looks at her. He like, mm, you kind of cute. And she's like, there's going to be a robbery and there's going to be, she's like, she's got her young body and she's like, I am kind of cute. And she's like, <laughs> and you still looking good too. Cause you my man and we going to be together for over 20 years and we going to have a son named Todd. She don't say this, but this is what she thinking. Uh -huh. So she walk in there with confidence. Like, let me go tell my man something who ain't met me yet. And she say, listen, Kelly, <laughs> whose real name is Ryan. And no one is shocked that she knows both names, by the way. <laughs> She's like, can I talk to Ryan Kelly? And they like, yeah, let me go get him. It's weird. <laughs> so, they're like, oh, they a little bit. Ask. They're like, how do you know that? They do ask. Somebody ask. But only after the fact. <laughs> she walk in like, hey, can I talk to Ryan Kelly? And he's like, yo. And she's <laughs> like, <laughs> she's like, hey, Ryan Kelly, it's going to be a robbery tonight. But they're going to get greedy and rob the car next door also. And that car is going to have a baby in the backseat. So you got to stop the first robbery at this address. And he's like, got it. Thank you. And they stop it. And the baby isn't stolen. And yay. yay. And guess when she wakes up, Alexis? Back at day zero. Back at day zero with a son that ain't killed nobody with a husband named Ryan. Ryan. And she finds out by going, hey, Ryan, can you pass the butter? He goes, yep. Because <laughs> 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 that's his name. Nice. She goes, is my dad alive? He goes, huh? No, I'm sorry, Jen. No. They're still very much in love. They still have Todd. Um, what else? Uh, yeah, he works as a police officer, a much more fulfilling life because he did love that job and he was trying to make a difference. So that's what he does now. She's still a lawyer. He's an officer. And Todd is a geek. Todd has a girlfriend, but it's not Chloe. It's Evie. Eve Green. And who is Eve? Eve is Chloe. The kidnapped baby. This is the thing. Chloe really is Todd's true love because they find each other again in this new present. And as Alexis gave away, <laughs> Eve, no, that's good. Eve was the baby in the car. So in the previous present, are you confused yet? In the previous present, that girl he was dating, Chloe, that was the baby from the backseat. The criminals just kept the baby and raised her and like gave her Chanel bags and she was glamorous. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but now, you know, she's still probably wealthy, uh, but she ain't stolen and she's not a secret. Uh, so yeah, and her and Todd are dating, and that's it. Epilogue. Uh, 
I don't even know if I want to go into that. I don't know. Basically, go ahead. No, go ahead. Go ahead. What? Basically, remember that client that became more of a friend to Jen? Uh-huh. Well, she has a deja vu episode about her bad kid uh, uh, named Connor. Okay. That's what that was about. Mm-hmm. Yeah. You and in the that. end, we're told these type of things can happen anecdotally when a strong force occurs within a mother and mother's instinct and lifting cars off of babies. <laughs> The end. (laughs) Alexis, you want to take a break? Yeah, let's do it. All right. And we're back. Alexis, please, what did you think of Wrong Place, Wrong Time by Jillian McAllister? And would you recommend this book? Let me first start by saying I really appreciated how well you retold the story. Um, Thank you, friend. You did a good job on that. Because I was really like, how is she going to retell this? Very interesting. You did a good job. Um, So, you know, I feel like there are some questions that were left unanswered. I don't know if that was intentional or not. Do tell. Like what? Um, She didn't go, unless I just missed it, she didn't go into... The brother's death, really. Um, Let me think. Well, she did say how he died, but I don't feel like Jen talked about that. You know, it wasn't discovered for Jen that the brother died and that he committed suicide. There's no conversation about that. I I guess it's not Mm -hmm. that important, but that's not in there. And then, or maybe when he got his real identity back. He told her like it like that would be something that he would, of course, would tell her and only would keep it from her if he was living as Kelly. So it wasn't necessary. So but did she but she doesn't know that that his brother committed suicide. She'd have to she doesn't know it yet, but she will as the new he'll be like, yeah, I told you that four years ago. (laughs) You know what I mean? Okay, And (laughs) because he's now Ryan. And then (laughs) was it so they said early on that. The things that she was doing that day and the previous day, they weren't sticking. So the mm-hmm. only time they would stick would be, and and I just want to make sure I understood this. The only time they would stick is when she went back and did the the change that initiated all changes. Is that right? Yeah, it only stuck that last day. Okay. When she stopped the theft of the car with the baby in the back. Okay. So you may be wondering, then why did she even wake up a day behind or two days behind? She should have just woke up the the day where she found the information that she needed to take. But she needed context. She needed to understand that her husband wasn't who she thought. And she needed to question things more. And it was preparing her to find the information that would then help her solve the case before it occurred. Minority Report. Okay, well, I really liked the beginning of the book. It was quite intriguing. I was immediately drawn in. Um, and as we went in, as we went through the story of her backing up, I felt like it was drawn out unnecessarily. I wanted them to bring it to an end quicker. And I don't know if it was because I was tired and reading and listening or if I just, I really needed that to just... Are there too many details here? I think there might be too many details here. So while I did enjoy reading the book, I felt like there was a lot of details in it. And I don't know that we needed to draw it out as long as it was drawn out. Um, And what I recommended, yes, I would definitely recommend it. I just have some feelings about it. Maybe another read through would make me feel differently about it. But yeah, Mm -hmm. it's a good book. Yeah, especially intrigued at the first part. But then I think feel like it really slows down after that. So how about you, Kari? Would you recommend this book? So uh, first of all, there's some strong language throughout this book because Jen, the character, is just um, potty mouth. She uses expletives to pepper her conversation and so does her husband. 
Um, also, when you get to the middle of the book, there's a lot going on. And I'm not sure it matters. I read this book twice mm. on the second reading. I didn't even know how it ended. <laughs> I, I was just, I was on the edge of my seat in the beginning. I said, oh, wait now. Did I read this? What happens? Um, in the middle of the book, I was like, oh, yeah, no, I read this. I just didn't care. Mm -hmm. So this is the thing. Yeah. This book should have been a short story mm -hmm. or a 250-page yep. book. Yep, 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 yep. Because the middle is dancing a lot and it's postponing for the sake of postponing yeah. to me. No, I also, Ezra as a character, unnecessary. The father could even be slimmed down as a character. I think that is a bit of a diversion or feed more into that story mm -hmm. of her and her father. We know there's um, a bit of stress in that relationship uh, and fine. Um, but his character didn't seem as necessary to her story as perhaps it should have been. I don't know. That's in my opinion. Um, and even Ryan's story, I like a good back and forth and not knowing what time you're really in with a character, i.e. the silent patient, but I don't think it was necessary in this case. Mm -hmm. We are with Ryan, to me, far too much. Oh, really? <laughs> I feel like you could have cut out Ryan's story all together. She follows Kelly to the courthouse and somehow there she just learns that, well, she learns that he's the officer and then assumes, of course, that he has another name because he's he's living undercover. undercover. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That's enough. The fact that he is actually named Ryan and not Kelly and that Kelly was his brother's name. That to me is superfluous. Mm -hmm. Like, I don't know. I don't think that's necessary. And. I, I didn't enjoy being with Ryan in this book. So there are two characters we follow, Jen and Ryan, and all the time we spend with Ryan, especially making those 911 calls where he's like picking up drunks and handling domestics. So that's just early I don't on. know. <laughs> I didn't need that. <laughs> it was boring. It was boring and it does not add to the story. So all of that to say... The idea, the root of this story, very interesting. Yeah. And I would I would really like to see this as a miniseries. I hope Jillian McAllister gets all her mm -hmm. coins. Um, she's obviously not a newbie. This is not her first novel, not her fifth. OK, she writes. Uh, however, I don't ever want to read this book again mm -hmm. and I wouldn't recommend it. Um, I can think of more concise, more engaging mysteries. Um, and this this is not one of my favorites. It, it was hard to get through the last third of this book. Yeah, it was drawn out. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it was yeah. drawn out for sure. It, um, mm -hmm. So we got some similar views on that. But definitely, um, it, it, it initially does grab your attention. So, yeah, first quarter of the book, very good. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Sorry to see it go. Drones on. <laughs> But I, I as soon as we get should. to Ryan, I think huh? <laughs> as soon as we get to Ryan's story, the book loses its Ooh, way. Oh no, I think I think his um, story <laughs> was contributing, having the run along because they were talking about the police, and initially I thought the police officer that they were talking about this Ryan character was the one that made the arrest. That's what I thought, and I think that's why I was able to keep up with him and find his path in it. We are giving clues um, when Todd is arrested that the officer involved is younger looking, handsome. And that is the same way she describes her husband, who we learned to be Ryan. And so there are shared ca characteristics. I do believe Jillian wanted us to believe mm -hmm. that Ryan was the officer arresting Todd. And then we're like, what? Ryan's Kelly. What? Right, right. right. And that's fun. Albeit unnecessary. Yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah. So there you have it. <laughs> Thank you. Wrong place, <laughs> wrong time. All the best to you, Jillian McAllister. Um, what are we reading mm -hmm. next week, Kari? Oh, that's easy. We're reading Room by Emma Donahue. Yay! Yes, yes. Looking forward to that read. Thank you for listening to Lit Society. We look forward to meeting up with you next week, Thursday. Lit Society is brought to you by me, Alexis Honoria, and...
Kari Herrera. Support the cause by leaving a five-star review for our show on Apple Podcasts mm-hmm. as well as Spotify. And leave a comment on Apple and Spotify about why you absolutely love us because we love you too. And if you mm-hmm. just, if, excuse me, if you enjoyed what you just heard, tell a friend about Lit Society. <laughs> Visit LitSocietyPod.com for show notes and this month's book list and to sign up for our amazing email newsletter. And until next time, readers, read something. Read something. <laughs>